Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Michael Trick, and I'm the dean here. Uh, at CMUQ, we are privileged to have many scholars and experts visit our campus each year to share their expertise. We created the Distinguished Lecture Series to showcase the depth and breadth of scholarship of these visitors in the various disciplines. Today's lecture is about the challenges that researchers face implementing AI systems. The lecture is named in honor of A. Nico Haberman, a pioneer of computer science and the founding dean of the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, which of course is a world leader in AI research. It is my honor to introduce the speaker today, a scholar who quite literally is following in the footsteps of uh, Nico Haberman. Marshall Hebert is the current dean of the School of Computer Science and a pioneer himself in the area of computer vision. Dean Hebert uh, joined the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon in 1984 and became part of the Autonomous Land Vehicles Program, a precursor of today's researcher, research on self-driving vehicles. For the next three decades, he led major research programs in autonomous systems, including ground and air vehicles, with contributions in the areas of perception for environment understanding and human interaction. Dean Haber's uh, research primarily centers on computer vision. He has led research on fundamental components such as scene understanding, object recognition, and applying machine learning to computer vision. To help meet the needs of a rapidly expanding computer vision industry, he created America's first master's degree uh, program in computer vision. Dean Haber became the director of the Robotics Institute in 2015 and was appointed dean at the School of Computer Science in 2019. <clears throat> in 2022, he was named a university professor. It's a funny title because most of us are university professors, but he is a capital U, capital P university professor, which is the highest honor that Carnegie Mellon provides to its faculty members. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dean Haber to the CMUQ Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for this uh, wonderful introduction. I like the uh, capital U, capital P. I'll have to emphasize that from, uh, from now on. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. I've been uh, trying to come here for the past, what, uh, three years or something? and then COVID and all kind of things. So uh, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here. And thank you to everybody who arranged my schedule and everybody I met uh, on this tour. That was wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do in the School of Computer Science. Uh, I'm not going to give you like a, uh, you know, um, exhaustive catalog of stuff, because there's a lot. Uh, but I'm going to give you a sample of, of projects uh, that revolve around this idea of uh, AI and machine learning, and more precisely, uh, big challenges in converting research in AI and machine learning uh, into systems that are actually operational in the real world. Uh, and I'll give you an example around four or five directions of work of example of projects in, in this area. Uh, before I do this, let me uh, remind you there will be a quiz at the end. Uh, there are seven uh, departments in the school. Uh, uh, we look at the, uh, the, the fundamentals of computer science in the computer science department. It's a great way of confusing everybody to have a computer science department inside the school of computer science. So, uh, uh, we look at uh, robotics, of course, machine learning, the fundamentals of machine learning and machine learning department, language technology, human in interaction, software engineering, and computational biology. The reason why I give you this list uh, is to emphasize the fact that uh, AI, machine learning, and related topics are not a single separate entity. They are pervasive across all seven departments and across everything that we do. Uh, and I'm going to uh, give you examples that come from uh, not all, but many of those departments to give you a sense of how it cuts, it cuts across. So let's see if this clicker works. Yes. Uh, so when we talk about AI, we talk generically about systems that can uh, somehow perceive the environment, uh, learn from, uh, from data, uh, make decisions based on those, on those models, and act in the environment, either fully autonomously or uh, with interaction with, with humans. Now, as we all know, that's kind of a, um, 
uh, standard thing to say, there's been tremendous progress in the past few years, uh, in part due to uh, uh, access to data, uh, computation, deep learning techniques, etc. Uh, so, so everything is going well, except there are major challenges where now we take those techniques and try to apply them to real world problems. Uh, so what I want to do is to show you a few things that we do, and again, those are samples. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list uh, to address those problems. The first area has to do with data. So we made a lot of progress <clears throat> in the past 10, 15 years or something uh, uh, in, in machine learning, in particular in AI in general, uh, thanks to the availability of massive amount of data. So that's wonderful, except much of the progress has been done because of massive amount of annotated data, supervised, curated data, okay? Now, that's fine in some uh, application, but in most applications, it is not. So in my world, computer vision, uh, we work with things like this, where somebody has painfully gone into the data and labeled stuff, millions of images. Now, millions of images, that's possible. Millions of video, that's not possible. Okay, that's, that just doesn't scale. Uh, the problem further is that even if you could label data for one particular setting, one particular application, you would have to do it all over again for a slightly different application. Uh, you cannot have adaptability. You want to be able to adapt to changing uh, condition, et cetera, rapidly without having to uh, relabel the data, recondition the data. Uh, now, this is an example from computer vision, but that is true uh, across the board. So, of course, one major uh, area of work is to try to minimize the uh, need for this carefully labeled data and, in fact, eliminate completely the need for labeled data. What can we do without uh, labeled data at all? And this is uh, basically what we are uh, trying to do. So let me give you uh, a first example. Uh, this is what you see from a typical self-driving car using vision or what you would like to see. Right? This is state of the art from a project with Argo AI, one of the large self-driving companies in, in Pittsburgh. And it's basically extracting objects, you know, segmenting them, cars, people, bicycles, and so forth. Now, to do this in particular, that's supervised, okay? You get this quality of result from labeled data, from training on, on very large set of labeled data. What you would like to do is to do this in a completely unsupervised way. What you would like to do is to have a whole bunch of video completely unlabeled, okay, and be able to learn a feature representation that then is going to uh, help you do basic tasks, like being able to detect objects, segment them, uh, et cetera, all right? So can we do this without any uh, uh, labeling of the, of the data? Well, there are things in the uh, literature, if I can get to it, that um, give us hope. Uh, so there are many recent techniques that, and I'm not going to get into the technical detail, but basically what they do is they take unsupervised data like this, and they learn how to divide the data into slots, right, unsupervised, right, so that you get this kind of, um, this kind of segmentation of the, uh, of the data. So that looks really nice, right? You have somehow, magically, it learned how to learn features that capture objects in the image, which is really fundamentally what you want for the, the most basic skill in understanding video. So that's wonderful. Now let's see how it works on uh, real data. Not great, huh? Uh, and this illustrates uh, an important point about this kind of uh, work. Uh, there's a lot of um, progress in designing architecture and so forth that do this kind of thing. The problem is they are based on implicit assumption about the data on the domain, simplifying assumption, like the kind of simple environment that you saw in the previous slide. Once you get in real data, then you run into those kind of problems. Uh, the, the real world is basically too far from that uh, simple toy kind of data to be able to uh, execute. So what we did, and that's a project with the uh, TRI, the Toyota Research uh, Institute, is to basically say, well, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try to do the same thing, right? We're going to have, you know, lots of unlabeled video. We're going to learn how to separate them into, into slots. And the uh, error that we're going to try to use to learn to do this is to reconstruct the video as well as possible from those slots. Now, as I showed you on the previous slide, said like that, that's not going to work. That's what I just showed you. 
what we're going to say is that, well, maybe we can add more information using the motion in the video. And there's computer vision techniques that can help you estimate the motion in the video. And from that, you can eliminate some of the errors uh, or many of the errors in the previous architecture. The point here being that when dealing with those kind of problems, it's important to think about all of the available information, all of the available data, and all the signals. In this case, the motion was used to correct basically the errors that we have and basically go from that toy environment to the real environment. Uh, and now we get something like this. Now, I don't know which video is going to work here. So this is the ground truth. This is what we'd like to do, you know, objects that are segmented like this. This is what we had with the state-of-the-art architecture but developed on, on those toy uh, uh, examples. And this is what we get now in the real world. It's not perfect, but it's much better. Now, keep in mind, if you're not in computer vision, you might think, well, this is not so good. Okay, but remember that this is done without any supervision. Nobody has told the system what's a car or what. Okay? So that's what we're trying to do. So this is an example from computer vision. Let me do, show you another example. Uh, also very recent, what I'm going to show you, it was just published, by the way, and one of them is an award-winning uh, paper. So this is very recent work. Uh, and the other context here is controlling robots. So one thing you would like to have is a system that learns how to have a person uh, control a robot, right? The, those are examples of uh, annoying ways of controlling robots. You know, you have uh, various contraption with virtual reality thingy that you have to wear. Uh, here you have gloves that are, you know, again, contraptions. And so. What you would really like to do is to have a system that simply looks at people, right, and learn how to manipulate things just by looking at people. W again, without supervision, without annotation, okay? Why uh, Bezos is in this picture, I don't know, by the way. See? Um, so how can we do this? Well, we can say, well, there's lots of data out there of people doing stuff, right, manipulating things, right? You have mil literally millions of videos on the web that you could use for training. So you could say, ha, I'm going to use all those videos where people are doing stuff with their hands, and I'm going to learn, learn a, uh, for example, a, 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 a deep network to go from the hand that I observe in the image to uh, a robotic hand, to uh, joint angles on, on the robotic hand, right? You can learn this. The only problem now is that to be able to do this, I need to have the ground truth for each of those videos. I need to somehow annotate those videos to tell the system, this is the joint angle that you should see, right? I'm holding it this way. Those are the joint angles. That should be the output. That's impossible, right? You cannot do that over millions of videos. It's simply impossible. So instead, what they did, uh, and this is the, uh, the work of uh, Deepak Patha's group uh, at CMU, the Robotics Institute, is to say, well, if I look at a hand grasping something, I don't need to have the joint position. All I need to do is to regress correctly the distance between certain points on the fingers. And that I can measure directly from the image. Remember, finding the, the right signal to be able to do the, the learning unsupervised without annotation. Okay, so if you do that, you can uh, generate, uh, you can actually learn this, you can generate a system that's going to look at all those images and learn how to derive the position of the hand such that those mutual distances are uh, respected. And those are mutual distances that you can automatically compute from the image. That's how it looks like. This is this curve here is the learning curve, basically, getting the error down and predicting better and better from the image the, the position of the hand. Completely unsupervised, right? Nobody annotates anything. It's just using those uh, images in the wild. And then what you can do is do something that was previously impossible, right? That's why I show it to you, uh, which is to uh, control a robot without any uh, external apparatus from a single camera image trained on entirely on labeled data, okay? Um, so those are a few examples here of uh, manipulation, and uh, those are a few other examples uh, here. Let me see here. It's moving, yeah. So those are, those are some examples of more complexity. Now, you have to remember 
Uh, there's no uh, vision here in the sense that uh, the system has never seen those objects, has no idea what's going on in the scene. It's just reproducing. It has just learned how to reproduce the uh, human uh, motion. OK, uh, so we can go even further than that, just to give you a sense of where we're going with those ideas. Uh, and this is part of a, of a very large effort in uh, learning in the wild for robotics. Right? Uh, you could imagine now doing much more complex uh, operation, uh, manipulation operation, like uh, you know, opening doors, uh, uh, opening faucets, and things like this. And again, having your robot learn how to do this in an unsupervised fashion using uh, a human, uh, human videos. Um, I can't go in too much detail, but the idea is the same. You take all those videos, you extract uh, hands things like, and motion and things like this. Those are things that we know how to do in computer vision, right? Uh, and you're going to uh, try to have the robot reproduce, reproduce this. Uh, one uh, technical detail here is that if you just do that the way, the way I described earlier, that's not going to work quite right because it's still very inaccurate. So what you're going to do is to explore around this initial model, right? And to have the robot try things, basically, doing exploration around that until it converges to, to a solution. But again, in a way that is completely unsupervised. That is the critical thing. Nobody gets in and, and gives ground truth to the, to the system. Uh, so this is an example here. So this is the, um, the view from the camera of the human opening a, a drawer, OK? And this is what the robot is going to do around the initial solution. It's going to try stuff around the initial uh, model that it has until it gets to a point, like here, it's going to get there eventually, where it has gotten to the, to the right type of motion. And now it knows how to do this, this door opening. Okay? Now again, if you don't do vision or robotics, this sounds a little silly. You know, why all this work to open a drawer? Well, this is uh, uh, an extremely hard problem to do it, again, unsupervised. Uh, those are a couple of, other, couple of other examples here of the kind of uh, actions that can, that can be done. This is another view of this, of many different uh, actions that are no learned here completely uh, unsupervised. So now you can actually think of real home robots that don't need extensive uh, training and manual, uh, manual annotation to be, to be trained. OK, so that was one uh, a little bit long-winded, actually, uh, explanation of uh, what we're trying to do in reducing data. Uh, another problem that we need to look at is to understand better where the data comes from, OK? So there's a tendency now, especially in systems that use black box machine learning, to say, well, this is my data. This is my black box machine learning, usually a deep network. And this is my loss function. And we are done, OK? Completely neglecting to understand where the data comes from and what its uh, characteristics are. Uh, the problem, and this is what I want to uh, mention here as an example, uh, the problem is particular. So, so this is fine if you have data from a sensor, right? You have some kind of sensor that you can characterize. You understand how it works. That's OK. You have numbers and vectors. That's fine. But this is not fine at all when you have things that are human-generated data, OK? Uh, and human-generated data means it's everywhere, actually. <laughs> Uh, peer review, those of you who have submitted papers, got paper rejected, and you look at the review sideways and wonder why. OK, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, hiring, uh, admissions, uh, everything that has to do with crowdsourcing, product rating, healthcare, questionnaires uh, of patients. All of those are human-generated data. The problem with this, it's not just numbers and vectors from a sensor. right? It's uh, subject to uh, bias. It's subject to. Uh, noise, it's subject to subjectivity. By definition, we humans, we, it's subjective. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's um, uh, subject to deliberate uh, fraud or adversarial uh, aspects. Uh, so now the question is how to, um, how to characterize this. In other words, how to model those effects in a way that it can be taken into account explicitly in the system. So this is the work of, uh, in the machine learning department of Niharsha. And I emphasize this because this is, uh, asp those are aspects that are quite often neglected. Right? There is this belief that as, as, as long as I have enough data, things are going to be OK. Right? Uh, so those are the kind of things that, that we look at, designing 
new algorithm. Uh, uh, the second one is particularly important, is how to convert those uh, qualitative concept of subjectivity and bias and all that in human data into something that is mathematical or actionable in, in, a, uh, uh, in, in a system. Okay. Uh, let me skip maybe that, uh, that one. Uh, okay, so that was about data. A second uh, area that we uh, look at is performance. Now, by performance here, despite the little uh, picture here, uh, by performance here, I don't mean necessarily uh, speed or efficiency. What I mean by uh, performance is uh, simply the fact that the system performs at a certain expected level of uh, performance uh, given the current con condition. Okay? Um, so let me give you uh, uh, an example of what I mean here. Uh, this is, again, an example from uh, computer vision and robotics where you have a system moving around. It has a camera sensor, uh, and it's looking around. It needs to find objects and segment things. Um, and things are okay when the lighting is okay and the conditions are good. That's kind of somewhat okay segmentation. But things break down completely uh, if the condition, the observation condition are not quite right. Okay? The problem is there is that, so that's not surprising, right? If, if you observe things in, in conditions that are degraded for whatever reason, the output is also going to be degraded, uh, and uh, that's going to cause degradation of performance of the system, in this case, driving. The problem is, how does the system know this, right? How can the system itself determine that it's now operating on the degraded condition. So to take a very simple example, right, kind of silly example, if you're driving on the road and all of a sudden you're surrounded by fog, which probably never happens here, right, but, but imagine, use your imagination. Suddenly you, you're surrounded by fog, you automatically know that your vision system and your driving system is impaired. And you're going to enter a different uh, mode of, uh, um, different mode of driving. I'm sorry? Sandstorm, okay, sandstorm is the equivalent, yeah, okay. Um, so the problem is we don't know how to do that generally with AI system. There is no systematic way of self-evaluating, of having proper performance evaluation so that the system can adapt this performance to the, to the condition and more importantly, detect those conditions where it cannot operate uh, properly. Uh, let me give you one example of, of what I mean. Uh, this is an uh, example here from the uh, drone world. So this is a uh, flying drone uh, with monocular flight. So it's looking at a single camera, which you see here. Uh, and this is a, a view of the 3D situation. It does basically a coarse 3D reconstruction of the environment as it's flying. Uh, and what you see here is the different trajectory that it evaluates and decides on one trajectory to, uh, to fly. So it, it does this every few milliseconds, basically. Look at the image. We construct some 3D, evaluate trajectories, and then pick a trajectory to, to fly through. Um, so this is fine. This is, this is working nicely, right? The problem, of course, is that if this process degrades going from the image to uh, the 3D, we're going to have a catastrophic failure. This is a drone. If it fails, you cannot recover. Right? So the question is, is it possible to automatically, or to learn, actually, how to automatically recognize that we are in degraded situation. The example of the fog, sorry, the sandstorm, uh, that you are in degraded uh, situation and you need to enter a different, uh, a different mode of operation. Uh, so just one word as to how that works. Uh, there's, a, there's a training phase that basically records uh, what are the, um, the trajectories that are feasible or not, compares the, the ground truth on those trajectories to what the system computes and extract features from the environment and for the observation that uh, are predictive of the performance of the system. So in other words, the system can self-evaluate its performance uh, to make decisions uh, as to its, its behavior. This is the equivalent, again, of your own brain recognizing that your visual system is, is uh, impaired. Uh, so this is an example here. You're going to see the drones flying here. This is the same display as before, except that here there's a scale. Zero means that everything is fine. The system thinks that the operating conditions are optimal, essentially, uh, and, and everything is fine. When it goes to one, it means that it believes that the uh, operating conditions have uh, degraded, and it's no longer able to, um, 
able to uh, operate correctly. So this is how this, this looks like. Assuming the video starts, yeah, there we go. So initially, everything is fine. It says there's, there's a low failure probability for the, for the system. And it's going to get to, to a point here where the vision system, for some reason, has issues. It recognizes that. It's going to stop, hover around, until it can reacquire a view where it is now confident again that the system is, um, is operating properly. Okay. So this is basically the idea, and this goes on the different titles, right? This goes on the uh, titles, uh, on the um, uh, introspection, self-evaluation, uh, performance modeling, and things like that. Uh, and in fact, uh, all of the agencies that in, in the US, DARPA, NSF, ONR, and all that, have national programs around those topics. The reason being that you can deploy a system, you can convince yourself that some, the vision system is 99% accurate or something, that still tells you nothing in terms of what's going to happen in the real condition, especially in conditions that are outside the boundaries of which it has been trained. Okay? So this is what, we, what we're trying to do uh, here. OK, so we talked about data. Um, we talked about performance. Uh, let's talk about objectives. So what, I mean by, what do I mean by objectives? When we build these systems, right, they are always built around the idea of uh, optimizing something, right? In deep learning, it's optimizing some loss function, some objective, depending on how you want to call it. In search type of thing, it's minimizing your, or maximizing your cost of some sort, okay? Now, the basic problem is that what you minimizing, what, what you're optimizing has to, obviously, has to match what you're trying to do in the real world, right? Car, at minimum, I try to not crash, right? It should at least optimize that. So that sounds like you, you know, the mother of all obvious statements, right? The problem is we don't know how to do that very well. Okay? So let me give you, go back to my previous example here. Uh, when we do those kind of things, under the hood, the objective function that we're optimizing, right, the stuff that we're optimizing, is that we're trying to minimize the number of mislabeled pixels. Right? We're trying to minimize the number of errors in labeling those pixels. Or conversely, we're trying to get to a point where uh, maximize the, the number of correctly labeled pixels, or said another way, the ob my objective here is to label every pixel correctly. Right? That's really the overall objective. Problem with that, there is no universe where there's an application where you need to label every pixel correctly. Okay? It just doesn't exist. There's no application that requires that. So what that means is that we s the, the computer vision part of the driving system is optimizing the wrong problem the wrong objective function, and worse than that, it's optimizing one that is actually much harder than what's actually needed to solve the real problem that we're trying to solve. That's what I mean by the uh, problem with objective. Um, <clears throat> so in the previous example, uh, it's easier. Well, let me show you what I mean in the previous example. In the previous example, we could say, well, uh, the thing that I'm going to try to optimize in my vision system, in my drone vision system for my little drone here, I'm going to try the most accurate 3D representation. Okay? And so the objective here is how accurate is the 3D world that I'm reconstructing. But that's not what I want. I don't care if I reconstruct this, this tree here with one millimeter accuracy or two millimeter accuracy. What I care about is how well the task is performed. That's the only thing I care about. Meaning, all I care about is that the trajectory that I select doesn't hit anything. I don't care about the accuracy here of the 3D reconstruction. So that's the same example as with the pixels. Uh, so we can do that having the correct objective for things like this, um, in particular in robotics, where we have kind of a binary physical output. Either I hit something or not, either I grasp successfully something or not. But now there are cases where you have very uh, elaborate things, like, like this interaction. This is a project with the Army Research Lab, uh, where the, um, the objective now, the end-to-end -end objective, is very difficult to define. Right? So this is still an open problem to this question of uh, using the right, the right objective for, for, the, for the AI system. Um, another um, Consideration in choosing how we design those AI systems and what we optimize, really, directly or indirectly, 
uh, are the uh, consequence of those, those AI systems. So let me show you an example. This is a classical setup, in particular in reinforcement learning, right? It's the inverted pendulum, right? And you want to learn a policy that will control the pendulum, right? So, so that it, it remains vertical. Now, when you learn those things with reinforcement learning or something, you don't care how many times the pendulum falls, right? You can, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, you can take as long as you want, as many samples and failures as you want. There are many other examples where you can't do that, okay? In fact, in most examples, you can't do that, right? And there's, um, if you don't, you know, not understanding that distinction can lead to a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic result. So this is another thing that we look at, uh, and we look at that with, I should, by the way, I should remember to, um, uh, to mention uh, the people here on two, two main labs in the uh, cooperative AI lab, which is a lab of Vincent Konitzer, a new uh, a senior faculty, but new at CMU, uh, and the Responsible AI Initiative, which is uh, an initiative across the university, but in particular in SES and the, the Heinz College, looking at those kind, those kind of problems. Uh, this is an example of what, I'm, uh, what I mean. This is a famous example for, uh, from Tromash uh, Sandholm on a kidney exchange, right? Uh, so imagine that you have uh, donors of kidneys, one and two. Uh, they have uh, people who are, uh, sorry, uh, uh, people who need uh, kidneys, one and two, and potential donors, except they are incompatible. So they need to be swapped with other donors. Now, if you have thousands or tens of thousands of those people, and you're trying to find the optimal swaps so that you maximize the, uh, uh, the transplant, you have a massive combinatorial problem. Uh, so this is uh, actually a natural uh, uh, system. Uh, and then this illustrates the, the point I was making about the objective. What is the objective that is optimized here? Does it take into account the age of the patients? Does it take into account the lifestyle? Does it take into account other factors, uh, economic factors, and so forth? Those are important uh, questions that go to the uh, effect of the, uh, the AI system. Um, so the, the other aspect of that is uh, understanding the uh, uh, AI uh, impact. And this is just a, uh, a picture of uh, what we're trying to do in this uh, responsible AI, uh, which is basically looking at all of the steps of the uh, AI system, including uh, the um, uh, oversight, the effect on uh, impacted uh, community, basically the people who are going to be impacted by the system, to understand in detail uh, how to design this, the, those, those objectives. So that's, and this is the work, by the way, of uh, Honda Edari at uh, Machine Learning Department, who leads the uh, SCS part of the Responsible AI initiative. Um, <clears throat> just skip some details of that and go to the next section. So we talked about data, we talked about performance, we talked about objectives. Everything that I've said so far considered one AI system in isolation, okay? In practice, of course, most AI systems are going to either intera interact with multiple systems or even more are going to interact with, with people. Uh, and in fact, a lot of what we do uh, in the school uh, has to do not just with AI system, but has to do with people, modeling people, modeling interaction, uh, interaction with people. Uh, so there are two, two aspects to that. The first one uh, is not just to understand or to, to predict something now, but to be able to predict in the future, future action of other agents in the, in the environment. And the second one is to understand interactions between uh, other agents. So let me, let me explain that in a little bit more detail. This is an example here, simple example. Uh, let's say you have a, a person uh, crossing here. Uh, it's very unlikely that she's going to make a sharp right. It's very likely that it, she's going to cross, and it's ex extremely unlikely that she's going to go uh, diagonal, right? And we, we can roughly agree on, on this, right? Why do we agree on this? It's because, of course, uh, this is, you know, uh, basic observation, but there's elaborate theory in, in, in uh, psychology and neuroscience, et cetera. We have an elaborate theory of how we make decisions and how we, uh, we uh, operate in the world. In other words, if I uh, interact with you, you, you know you, you have expectation as to how I'm going to uh, interact, and I know that you have those expectations. That's how we can interact properly. 
So that tells us that if we are to have AI systems that can interact properly, we need to have this capability of doing prediction. Or in other words, is to, uh, a more proper word is to do forecasting, basically. That is, to have a model of how the other agent, whether it's human or AI, is making decisions so that it can interact with this other agent. So how can we do this? How can we do this simple thing of observing a person and predicting, forecasting, how this person is going to behave? And again, fundamental to uh, any uh, AI system. So let me show you a couple of examples of that. This is, again, a very, very recent result last year, uh, showing you how far we can go now in doing uh, forecasting. So what this is going to show uh, is an experiment where uh, somebody is wearing a camera. So the input is the, the basically what the, what the person sees. And the output is the prediction of what this person is going to do in the future. And of course, it's multimodal because there's not a single thing that one can do in the future. Uh, so here, there are three different modes of what this person is expected to do. The only input here is uh, the egocentric view, basically what the, what the person is seeing. Okay? Uh, so this is just a, an example of what I mean by forecasting. It's basically getting input data, having learning a model of behavior and being able to forecast the future, future behavior. And that is this. If you think of driving in a street, for example, you actually do this all the time, right? You forecast mentally the behavior of all the pedestrians around all of the other drivers so that you can make your own decision. Of course, you don't do that uh, consciously. So this was with one uh, person. Uh, in reality, the real world, we have many, many agents. We need to be able to uh, understand the interaction across a large set of, of agents. And now things explode. Uh, this is an example here, again from uh, Chris Catanini's, Catanini's group. Uh, and what we're doing here, if you look at this person here, number 18, what we're showing with those lines are the most likely future trajectory of this person. Right? So this is forecasting over a long term. Now, there are three different ones. It's going to play again. Okay? Hopefully, it's going to play again. No. I have to go back. There we go. OK, so there's three of them, or three or four of them, because obviously there are different uh, uh, possible decisions that this person can make. So this is a very hard problem, because underneath that, there's an entire probability distribution. And what you see here are the modes of that probability distribution as to what's most likely. Importantly, to be able to do this, we need to use uh, a lot of techniques that are outside of what you know, people think uh, typically as machine learning techniques, uh, in particular techniques from uh, game theory. Uh, in fact, this uses a uh, technique in game theory called a fictitious play. And the reason why this gets very complicated and combinatorial is because if you think as a situation like this, the way one person acts depends on how the way person A uh, moves depends on how person B moves. But the way person B moves depends on how person A moves. So you can see how this leads into uh, pretty much untractable uh, combinatorial optimization. And that's the problem that, we, that we're solving. Uh, we need to be very careful um, about how we uh, think about interactions. There's many, many examples in uh, the history of AI, in fact, in history in general, on how this can be done wrong. So this is a simple view of an AI agent, right? It observes its environment. Uh, uh, it, um, uh, it evaluates possible actions and, and then um, uh, execute the actions based on observing the other agents. So a lot of things can go wrong. Um, a basic game theory tells us that it can go into some nonsensical situation. It has various terms, the tragedy of the commons and prisoner's dilemma. And things. It's, those are basically uh, 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 nonsensical, absurd situation that, that should not occur between engines. Um, it can uh, go into a, a, a basically a crash, never-ending um, never um, uh, minimum. Uh, this is an example here from the 2010 um, uh, stock exchange uh, crash, where basically multiple automated agents uh, basically fed each other to, to essentially lead to, the, to a, massive, a massive crash. Uh, this is another example here. It's a little bit hard to see, but basically what it says is that if you use those theories, like game theory, uh, as is, uh, without care, uh, you can end up with situation where there is an equilibrium. So you have those two, person A and person B. There's an equilibrium. But it's actually the worst possible outcome for both. 
This actually happens a lot. So the point of this verbal <laughs> discussion is to say that what we're looking at, and especially with, through uh, Vincent Lab, is ways to use those tools in conjunction to all the other tools, the, the whole toolbox that we have in AI, to be able to, to do those things. In other words, to be able to model, forecast, and reason about uh, interaction uh, at scale. The last thing that I want to mention, that's the last one. <laughs> um, we, we talked about earlier about me not, not being good at keeping time, so that's why I said that. Uh, the last one that I want to mention has to do with uh, system uh, consideration, okay? Um, I said, and we all know this, that massive progress has been made uh, uh, thanks to the um, uh, you know, increase in computing and GPUs and all that, Every, everybody knows that. Uh, the slight problem with that is that the complexity of the architectures is, of course, outpacing uh, the progress in the, uh, uh, in, in the hardware. So we need to uh, think more deeply uh, in how to uh, uh, optimize uh, those, uh, those models. And here, for this part, I'm, I'm talking specifically about deep learning, uh, deep learning model. Uh, the, the work that I'm going to mention, I'm going to go very quickly on it. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, this is referring to a group, uh, a large group actually at SES across multiple departments, primarily CS uh, uh, and MLD, but, but others too, uh, called the Catalyst Group, and looking basically at uh, systems issue in AI and ML, uh, ML system. So the basic problem is <coughs> that we, uh, we have... Basically, we're dealing with uh, deep learning architectures in this particular case uh, that we want to parallelize because the computation is inherently parallel. Uh, we want to do it in a way that is not static, right? Because you, you could think of, you know, optimizing things to death, right? Problem is the next Europe's conference, you have 50 new uh, operators and, and 100 new ways of doing that architecture. So you need to have something that can quickly optimize this, not something that statically uh, does optimization. Um, and then the, the, uh, we have uh, various types of hardware, again, evolving fairly quickly. You need to be able to also optimize based on the, on the hardware. Uh, so this is hard. And this is why we have a large group looking at this. And I invite you to look at their web page for, for a lot of detail. But let me give you a quick uh, uh, you know, a teaser of the kind of things that they do. So this is your machine learning model, your deep learning model, right? Uh, and you can do three things. The first thing you can do is optimize the topology of that model. So you, you don't care about hardware or anything. You just optimize the, this graph, right? Uh, the second thing you can do is to parallelize, okay? Break it into, into pieces that are parallel. And the third thing that you can do is to take into account the details of the target hardware. Right? to optimize further how this, this computation is organized. Uh, so that's basically what they do. Okay? So on the first one, uh, here is an example of what, what, uh, what we mean. Uh, so this is a, uh, an example of a toy uh, deep learning network. It's not deep, so I don't know what it is, but network. Okay? Uh, and you can do things, those are classical things, right? You can do things like saying, well, uh, this operation, convolution and relu, I can combine it into a single uh, node and a single operation, right? That's a simple rule. If I have those things, I can do that, okay? And then I can change this network to that. The problem with this, and this, there's a lot of that around, okay? This, this exists, right? This is what we call rule-based optimizer. You have a huge set of rules, and you're going to use those rules to try to, to optimize the, the architecture. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that that doesn't scale, right? That doesn't scale because one has to... Uh, uh, of course, propose uh, those rules and then uh, uh, apply those rules. What you really want to do is to search through a very large dictionary of rules and search for the uh, substitution that will give you uh, a, good optimi a good optimization and to do that op uh, uh, automatically. Uh, so that's what they do. And this is basically what it does. Uh, at a very high level, you have your graph, right, the, the, that, that network you're going to have a lot of candidate substitution. Uh, verify the validity of those substitutions. You're going to propose a lot of substitution. You're going to verify that validity and get the ones that are verified as the, uh, 
as the output to, the, uh, to have a, a graph, uh, an optimized uh, graph. So I know this is very high level because I, I need to go quick on this, but the basic idea is to replace this uh, semi-manual uh, rule-based um, uh, approach with something that is fully automatic and that is fast is another uh, thing. Uh, the, the next thing is uh, prioritization, and this is the same in the same spirit. Instead of having rules for prioritization that are going to help you uh, separate the computation, let's do it entirely uh, automatically by taking as input two things, the computation graph that I have before, the description of the hardware, okay? And from that, we're going to search through uh, a, a very large number of candidate strategy for prioritization. And this is done using your sampling technique. This is a Monte Carlo, a Monte Carlo sampling. For each of those samples, we're going to execute a simulator uh, and uh, find the best, the best strategy. So you can, you can think of that as a high level. Again, there's a lot of details that I don't have time, but uh, at a high level, optimizing over a large set of strategies for prioritization. Um, and the nice thing uh, about that uh, is that you can show uh, considerable improvements. So this is an example here on an application of the, the training throughput. So the measurement in those things is typically how many samples you can fit through the system when, when training, okay? Uh, so this is uh, 10,000 here, if you cannot read that. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the green and blue, are for two different techniques that are kind of classical techniques uh, to do that prior optimization. This is what, what they can do with uh, this automatic search. Uh, so you get up to a 10 times speed up uh, with the number of GPU, but more importantly, it scales with the number of GPU, whereas those techniques become rapidly, uh, basically uh, unscalable with the number, the number of GPU. The other thing that is not on this graph is that that optimization is actually fast, okay? If this were taking, you know, five-year CPU, five-year GPU, that would not be particularly useful, okay? So th this optimization is fast. It's in minutes or hours, depending on the architecture, but it's something that is completely feasible, right? If you change the architecture, you can rerun this and re-optimize. It's actually doable. Um, oh, by the way, this, uh, this is on a real, um, this is on a real task. Uh, this has to do with ads optimization. I believe it was from Facebook. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, example uh, here. So the, in this case, the, the uh, vertical axis is different. It's the uh, per epoch training time. So each, how much each iteration of training, how much time each iteration of training uh, takes. A and again, the orange line is uh, this approach uh, that shows the, um, the uh, um, the uh, game. Uh, again, this is a real application. This, uh, this was done with uh, Los Alamos uh, on medical, Los Alamos uh, National Lab uh, on medical data. So it's important that it's real data, not in a real task, not, not a toy, uh, toy data. So uh, in any case, and the reason why I mentioned Los Alamos and Facebook is that this is actually a, a large uh, consortium uh, around this uh, Catalyst group uh, looking at a lot of uh, real architecture, real problems, and looking at this, this question of system, uh, systematic, I, I'm going to say it, systematic system optimization. Yeah, I said it. Uh, so if you want more detail, please look at the Catalyst, um, Catalyst page. So uh, this is what I wanted to uh, tell you about. Uh, basically, a few areas that, that we're looking at, and for each, I just gave you a couple of examples. Of course, we have a lot more in each area. Uh, looking at issues of reducing the uh, uh, supervision of, of, of data uh, on supervised training, et cetera. Uh, defining objectives, this concept of, you know, what you're trying to optimize is actually important as it relates to the real task. Uh, the issue of, of performance and understanding the performance of the system. Uh, predictions on interactions. Now looking at multiple agents, in particular human agents, and doing forecasting and interaction modeling. And finally, finally, looking at the entire system and optimizing the, the system. So those are a few of the things that we uh, look at, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll find it, you found it uh, interesting. And I'm done, almost on time. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you, Marshall. Um, so we have uh, we have a little time for some questions. I want to encourage everybody to please raise your hand, ask at will. I will just kindly ask you if you're interested in posing a question, press the button at the mic, and um, so that we can record what you say. So questions. This one over there. This is a courageous one over there. I'll start us off. So yeah, in some of your right. earlier slides, you were talking about unsupervised learning, and you had a nice graph that showed that it kind of its error rate got less and less. Yeah. If it's unsupervised, how do you calculate an error rate if you don't have ground truth? Oh, that, that was so. This is going back to that drawing with the uh, the fingers, right? So, um, so the supervision would be to say I, I measured. I'm going to give ground truth on my joint angles there, right? So that's supervised. You're right. Uh, the observation is that we don't need to predict the joint angle. What we need to predict, and this, by the way, this is an old trick in geometry and things like this. Uh, it's called relative invariance and things like this. Uh, what we can predict instead is the distance between, the, uh, between key points on the fingers, right? The key being, no pun intended, the key being that I can detect those key points in the image. That's a computer vision problem that's solved. Right? Uh, I can measure those distances, right? and I can, I can make that, that prediction. Right? So in other words, I see my hand here. I'm going to generate control of the robot hand such that the distances between those, those key points on the robot hand are the same that on the, uh, on the image. Nowhere in this process have I annotated anything, because those things are extracted automatically from the image. So this is the fundamental idea, basically, in, in, in those, the other example, too, with the motion, is to think uh, about what type of signal can I, can I inject in the system that's available for free, but still <coughs> gives me enough supervision. And in this case, the signal is those relative invariants. I know I can extract that from the image. And then I can calculate. I know it's, it may not be completely obvious, but I can calculate that if I predict those correctly, it's going to get me the right shape of the hand. So finding the signal, in the other example, it was using the motion in the video and saying, you know, the state of the art technique does not use the motion, it uses only the images. If I use this little bit more uh, information, it's going to give me enough supervision to move to the right, to move to the right place. Um, in one of the early slides, you said something about, specifically in the performance section, uh, we talked about that we don't care how well we analyze the environment. We care about more about how well it performs the task. How are these two things, like, different? Oh, they, they are, comp yeah, th so this is uh, 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 quite important. Uh, you go back to my example of the drone, right? Um, I could try to solve the problem by building the best vision system in the world and trying really, really hard to reconstruct the environment so that this point here is a sub-millimeter accuracy, right? But that doesn't really matter. I don't care. If I move here, I don't care if I have this at a millimeter accuracy or not. All I care about is that if the, the trajectory that I take avoids the obstacle. You, you, see, you see the difference? So in this system, the way the system works, it's, called, it's a technique called receding horizon. It's a classical technique in control. And it basically evaluates a family of trajectories. So imagine I'm here, and I have 100 trajectories that are candidate trajectory. Okay? Um, and I'm going to evaluate those trajectories. And if this one does not intersect my 3D reconstruction, I'm going to take it. The only thing that I care about is that I pick a trajectory that is clear. That's all. I don't care how accurately this is reconstructed. Right? And my point is that if all you say is that we care about the reconstruction, we're going to spend all of our energy in optimizing this reconstruction, right? where we should uh, spend the energy somewhere else. And, and the point also of tr when I say we're trying to solve a problem that is too hard, what can happen and what does happen in system is that because we try so hard to optimize this, to have the most accurate 3D reconstruction, we're going to have actually a more brittle system. Because the vision system might be more brittle, you see? Because I try to make it so precise that it might actually be more sensitive to, I don't know, shadows or something, or changes in the environment. 
If I have a system that maybe is a little bit less accurate in 3D, it might be actually more robust and might actually work better for the final task. You see the distinction? Yeah, just uh, going back to this unsupervised uh, case. I, I'm not sure I it's okay. Going back to the unsupervised uh, case. So those, sig I mean, I mean, the, uh, what kind of architecture are you using to use those signals? And also, can you relate to uh, weak supervision? Can be, uh, can this be a technique be also? Yeah. Used? So when, when I say so, that we might um, we might quibble about the, t uh, the terminology. You're right. Uh, so when I, what I mean by unsupervised in this context, what I mean is um, uh, supervised by a signal that is not uh, uh, externally provided. That's that's what I mean. All right. Right. So if you look at the architecture, it looks like it's supervised, right? Supervised by my, um, in this case, by my uh, relative environment, my relative uh, uh, key point, right? So if you just look at that, yes, you're right. The, the, the learning is then, is then supervised. The point is that that signal is generated directly from the images, right? Without, without annotation, without going to. How does it compare to using just weak supervision so you can write functions So, so that, yeah, I'm sorry. How does it compare to, uh, I mean, one thing that people have used is to do weak supervision, which is basically you write roots or functions that helps you to annotate <coughs> this, uh, your data instead of the taking, like, uh, for your case, taking the images and doing the rounding, uh, I mean, the bounding box with the card and with this. So you write roots based on some heuristic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so that, you're right, that, that works. So for the first example, uh, you can do, uh, you can think of doing things like this, right? So with supervision, meaning that you, and in fact, we have comparisons with this, if I remember correctly. I don't remember what the result was, but uh, where you, you say something about the image as opposed to detailed bounding box. So in those vision problems, you can do this. In the other case, you cannot, because you need to find a, a joint angle so you can, you know, grasp the object, do whatever action uh, is being demonstrated. So there, there's no concept of weak supervision, really. Right? I know it, there will be a chance to continue the chat outside. I know we want to try to our best to respect if you guys have something else you need to get to. So thank you all for showing up today. I'll hand over back to Mike. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Marshall. It is uh, clear Carnegie Mellon is the place for AI, um, and it's great to see all the applications with vision and AI coming together. So thank you for providing this uh, distinguished lecture. We do have a little token oh, of wow. uh, appreciation, so thank you for that. We're going to stand over here, and we're going to take some pictures.